Good morning, and uh, first of all, thank you to CETA for this kind invitation to come and present to you today. Um, the project, as you'll see from the initial uh, slide here, is, is rather unique and complex and challenging. And the great, the great news is that actually what I'm going to be telling you is a bit of a success story. And it's a success story for a number of different reasons, which we'll touch on. And one of those, especially, is the fact that our contractor on this project is BAM, who bring with them a wealth of BIM experience from right here in Ireland. I noticed earlier that there's actually a sort of fact page in your, in your folders on the, on the, on the, on the table. Um, so, so really I don't have to tell you anything, just read this and that's you, that's you good, but um, there's some really great information there. So the first thing really to say is that um, this is a project designed by Killer Design Architects who are actually based in Dubai and it was actually part of a competition win um, and um, as it says there, completion mid-2019. Um, as you may or you may not know, in Dubai at the moment, um, everything is driven by the Expo 2020. The World Expo has been held in Dubai in the year 2020. And pretty much every construction project in Dubai has that deadline that it has to be complete by the Expo. So myself, I'm Craig Garrett from Bureau Hapold Engineering, um, originally from Scotland, as you might have guessed, but been in the Middle East for the past eight years, and the last three of those being specifically in Dubai. I've been really fortunate in that time in the Middle East to have worked on what I consider to be some of the most complex and iconic projects in the region, and some of the photographs that, that, that are, you see here. And the top right hand corner especially is the Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi which has actually just recently opened to the, to the public. And I've, uh, I've been very lucky to be along there as a visitor and it is quite stunning if you ever get the opportunity to go there. In my current role at the moment I'm actually operating as an as a, in a sort of information management services role. And what that's, what that's letting me do at the moment is actually to take the experience that we've gained over these really um, complex projects and go out and talk to groups like yourselves and in the industry and share experience. And that was mentioned, you know, this idea of sharing experience. And it was great even with uh, ACB earlier. It's all about sharing that knowledge so that others can learn from it. The great news for us is that as Bureau Hapold, we've recently won some industry awards in the Middle East. And for us that means the world because it's actually the industry acknowledging the level of expertise that we have within BIM in the region. So this is a quick, just a quick video to let you get a sense of the project. So the Museum of the Future is a project of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the leader ruler of the UAE. It currently sits right on Sheikh Zayed Road, a very famous road in Dubai, in front of the Emirates Towers where the Prime Minister's office actually is. The facade is covered with Arabic calligraphy, which is a collection of poems that the Sheikh has written himself. But the real challenge is the calligraphy is actually the windows. Again, 3D modeling used throughout, as you would expect, but it does let you visualize the project in a way like we've never really been able to before. In this case, understanding the complex shapes and spaces inside the building, of course, this curved architecture, has been critical. Very unique structural design and of course bespoke and unique facade 
which were planned the outside. The museum is not a traditional museum in the sense of artefacts, but more will act as an exhibition space for innovative technologies to be displayed. Just get some water, sorry. So this is the project team as it existed at the design stage. The Dubai Futures Foundation was the client, which is really the Prime Minister's office. Miras, who are the developer, a very famous developer in Dubai, who used ACOM as their cost consultant, and ourselves, Bureau Happold Engineering, as the lead consultant, with Killer Design as the project architect. And a wealth, of course, of uh, disciplines, as you would expect, many of which were supplied by Bureau Happold themselves, including some that you wouldn't necessarily think would be working within a 3D environment, for example, like the landscape architecture. What we're going to do today is briefly talk about client, consultant, contractor. So we've, I'm sure you've seen this image before, but we've cut it into four quarters. Unfortunately, we don't have quite have the operator in place yet. So we won't really talk about that today, but we will talk about client, consultant, and contractor. And I'll let these gentlemen introduce themselves. Good morning. Thanks, Craig. Um, very brief introduction, just we've been set up the other side of the story, and Craig is going to take you guys through the, the design aspect as well then, and we'll hop onto the contracting later on. But my name is Michael Murphy. I'm an operations manager with BAM in Ireland, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Simon Trishler as well, who's a, a deployment specialist for ourselves. So a big thanks to, to Cijan and the CIF for inviting us along to you know, present what is already an award-winning building. It's not even finished yet and it's already winning awards. So you know, we're very excited about it. I think when we started bidding this project, we were, when we, we were offered the opportunity by our international division to assist them with the bin delivery. We were very excited about that as well. So we, we, you know, we, we piled as much energy and enthusiasm as we possibly could into it. Um, so again, similar to Craig, very proud of some of our achievements. You can see this particular building also won the AC Excellence Awards at Autodesk University last year in 2017. So it's a building that even Autodesk themselves are, are, are all over. And again, it will be exhibited in AU London um, next week as well. So, you know, looking forward to that. So you can see the type of projects we're currently working on. National Children's Hospital, um, Microsoft um, Place, Boland's Key, and um, the Courts PPP. So we have a wealth of bin delivery experience. And this is something we were very keen to bring to the international division within, within BAM, and BAM Ireland is recognised as a centre of excellence for BIM delivery within the whole Royal BAM group as well. So it was fantastic to have them come to us looking for that assistance as well. So again, the CGI, and what I'm going to run here just to give you a brief introduction as to what life was like for us at the beginning and the type of things we would have done. You can see, you know, one of the submission articles was, of course, a 4D simulation, giving an indication as to what this is all about. So, Again, just another value-added benefit, of course, of this model was the fact that we could run 4D. So we, run, we ran multiple pro planning sessions across this with our planning teams as well to ensure that we had the most robust program in place. So, you know, BIM was the tool, it was the hammer we used, but lean construction application was really the methodology that was, was driven into this process to get the, the right type of approach for BAM. And to give our planners, um, you know, the security that they, they felt the program would work, it was legitimate. I mean, when you look at this frame, it's, it's when you take the skin off this building, you, see, you can kind of get an idea how it stands up. When the skin's on, it, it, it almost defies logic in some ways. But the complexity around the temporary works of this building is alone is, a, is, a, is a, you know, world class in its own right, because to get this building to stand prior to it actually being completed is quite complex. So an awful lot of thought went into that. As Craig said, you can, you can see the complexity of the, the Arabic writing on the facade as well. I mean, this is simply incredible facade and the first panels are landing now and they just they just look absolutely incredible and um, you know so an enormous amount of hard work went into you know thinking about how this building was going to be put together from the start so tight program nothing easy as you say everyone wants everything done 20 percent quicker 20 percent cheaper a whole lot but that's the, the, the minimum level of output would be required from ourselves at this point um, for, for buildings of this kind of complexity. So you can see where we are at this point in time. The jump shutter is, is just about up. The steel frame is, is flying along behind it. 
far quicker than we had anticipated, if I'm being perfectly honest as well. We're, we're really getting through that. And again, Simon will we'll run through later on, in large part, you know, thanks to the, the laser scanning and the, the type of accuracy that we're using at on site to make sure that when they go in, they're, they're in the right first time. We're not having to go back and, and look at it. So the technologies that have been applied here are really assisting us on site to, to rapidly deliver this particular building. And there's another image that's just taken last week as well. So you can actually see we're, we're, we're up further again at this point and the concrete works really have to kind of speed up to, to keep up with the, the progress so far. In terms of our team, again, we sit main contractor below um, Bureau Havel Engineering. Some of our supply chain, I, I really you know, couldn't overstate how competent our supply chain are. You would think, you know, possibly there'd be a lot of work to do there. These guys are world leading subcontractors and BAM as an international construction company would look quite strongly at some of these companies in the future as well to, to consider the type of work they can do. They are exceptional. And I'm not just saying that, they, they really have some prices. And <coughs> thanks to our supply chain here, this has kind of made the delivery of this building a bit more straightforward. You know, ever send I, Transgulf, these guys really know their stuff. Um, so, you know, really, really happy with the supply chain that's there. You know, delighted to be working with them as well. And there's not much effort in trying to move them along. They're, they're, they're kind of dragging us along in some instances as well. So finally, I'm going to move back onto the client led yep. section, which maybe take. So, the first part of the story, the client, a knowledgeable client, absolutely. We we're really, really fortunate that this was a client who knew from the outset what they wanted. But not just that. They actually were going through a transformation process themselves internally, like so many of the, so many of us all are. We are we're developing what this digital landscape is that we're working in. Miras identified that initially they needed some help, and they actually went out to Autodesk Consulting to get that help. Before they then set up their own internal BIM team called the Miras BIM Office, and the guy who we work with very closely was a BIM manager called Anthony Lapierre. Now the great thing here was again, he was, a guy, he was a guy prepared to look at things a bit differently, but he was very open to discussing and collaborating at a level that we've written, not, not really seen before. So when the employer's information requirements were written, the client, not only were they able to tell us what they wanted, they were able to tell us why they wanted it, the format they wanted it in, what they were going to do. They literally knew everything that they wanted to do. But the great thing was they were very open and honest and collaborative about how this document was put together and actually allowed us to input into what the content in that document was. So it wasn't this sort of book that you were being hit with, you will comply to this. We, it was very much a collaborative approach. But one of the great things was that what's normally not in these employers' information requirements is a lot of this stuff. A real sense of how you should really behave. A collaborative approach. Willingness to, willingness to discuss. That's not normally what things we associate with our clients these days. But that's exactly how this client was prepared uh, to develop the BIM implementation in this project. And they were very much, they understood that they didn't have all the answers. And what they wanted to do was to draw on the experience of the other people who were coming to the table to make the project much, much more collaborative. Now one of the, I'm sure you've seen this as well, but one of the things that Anthony used to draw as a, as a way of getting the message over was these sort of three triangles. And we're all too familiar with this in our, interest, in our industry. As we go from stage to stage, design to construction to operation, we have this handover. And quite often at that handover stage, we have this massive drop off in information. And why is that? And it's because we don't have joined up teams, so there's no trust in that information. Your contractor has never seen the design information before it gets handed to them to deliver. But actually what happens is, if you can introduce that contractor to the design team, 
And they actually work together to make sure what is handed over is what the contractor wants and needs. Then you have a very, very different picture. So one of the things we ended up with is that the client wanted this handover of information to only increase <clears throat> as it went through the process so that there was no loss, there was no drop off in trust and information and data that was being shared. And it was very much a seamless. Now, this is quite different thinking. This is not really quite often how our contractual industry is set up to do. You know, we're not really like that. We like things to have, you know, you finish your job then and you hand it over and then the next guy takes it. This is a different, this is a different way of working. But it worked for us. So Bureau Happold now lead consultant. So we come in with this client and we have this project to design. So we have a very large design team spread globally. Uh, these, are, these are Bureau Happold locations that were mainly involved in this project. And you can see the kind of numbers that you're talking about. And that includes the architect, it includes the client, it includes all these people. And they all have to be managed and they all have to be working together collaboratively. Big team to organize. But at the center of that, from a BIM perspective, we had three people. We had a client BIM manager, we had an architectural BIM manager, and we had myself on the, on the design side. And that was our little team at the beginning, three people. We met every single week. We talked through every single idea that was being put in that employer's information requirements. We created our BIM execution plan from that and everything that went into that document, we discussed and wrote in there together. And what a difference that made. It was so refreshing to actually sit with a group of people who were only interested in the well-being of that project and the BIM delivery of that project. So the documentation was very much developed with everybody in mind. It wasn't a case of the client dictating what was to happen. It was about the client agreeing with everyone what was to happen. Shared experience, because of course we're all coming from different, different backgrounds. We're all bringing different experience. Why wouldn't you want to share that? Common sense approach. Too often, our documentation that we are, we are producing, this, this BIM, these BIM manuals that, that we're getting so used to seeing now, have language and, 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 and discussion in them that half the time we don't even know what they mean. We had this approach where it was, things had to be written so that you could actually read them and understand them with a common sense approach. And if it wasn't something that added something to the project, then we actually took it out. And this again was a really great way to approach the job. Now in Dubai we have a mandate, we have a BIM mandate. It's not the greatest in the world, it's a single page, but it's there and it mandates BIM. But one of the great things is of course we have the UK level too. So for projects in the Middle East at the moment, especially in your tier one sort of contractors, consultants, it's basically the best of the UK level two that we're using. Because that is the standard, to be honest, that the majority of the world is just about to be an ISO that the majority of the world is using. But because it's not specifically mandated, we can actually take the best of it and maybe not necessarily do it all. So we kind of have the best of both worlds. To manage a big team like this, we needed a really robust common data environment, CDE, single source of truth where we could store, up, store all our information that everybody could access it in the cloud at any point, at any time, all revision controlled and, and all the good stuff that we're used to. When we started the project, we actually had Dropbox, but we, used, we realized very, very quickly that wasn't going to work. First thing is, of course, it's not even PAS 1192 compliant, so that had to go. What we did do is we actually, as the design team, put in place project-wise. Now that was a first for our company to put that in place. But it gave us the kind of functionality that we needed for this project. This was the key thing. 
And even although our client was using Iconex, Iconex is probably, I would say, the number one document management system in the Middle East at the moment. <coughs> I'm sorry. But this was great for us. And our whole design team was in that environment. There was a few other things. The nature of this project, the nature of the fact that it is the museum of the future, there were some specific challenges put on us. It wasn't enough just to build this building. If this was going to be a building that was all about innovative technology, we had to be seen to be putting innovation into the actual design and construction of the building itself. So that was a challenge for us as well. Not only the fact that we had to deal with all the iconic architecture and of course the unique facade. So for Bureau Happold, what this meant was an exceptionally high level of computational engineering. Now by that what I mean is I mean visual scripting tools like Dynamo, Grasshopper, these sort of things, driving our design decisions, connecting our authoring tools to our analysis tools. And only through being able to use some of these technologies that we have available to us now were we able to analyze and optimize the structure. The structural diagrid is obviously something that benefited from that process. Now, if you can optimize a structure, first and foremost, say, for the number of nodes in it, and you can get that number down, we're saying 40%, then that's construction cost that you're getting down. If you can optimize that structure for the steel that you're using, then that's material cost you're getting down. And if you can optimize that again for variations in that form, deviations in that forum, then again there's some real savings to be held there. But what visual scripting and what computational engineering lets you do that you could never have done before is it lets you optimize for all these three things happening at exactly the same time. And this is a sort of morphing type algorithm that you would see. I haven't got the, the video to show you unfortunately, but so basically what's happening is all these three elements have been optimized at the same time. You could never have done this in a manual simu you know, simulation. But this lets you come up with the optimum structure. And the benefits when you then rationalize across all three of these are massive. Massive. Our contracts more and more, our documents more and more are becoming contractual. EIRs, BEPs, these kinds of things are now being written into the contracts. And that's great because what that means is that that mandate or that instruction from the client, it's not just some sort of high level words. In there are actually the documents that they want you to work to. In this particular project, there were some real things that were done differently. The first one I want to talk about is model ownership. And interestingly, we were talking about you know, intellectual property and ownership earlier. Our client wanted the ownership of the models to change. They wanted the model that was created at the design stage to be passed to the contractor and that contractor to take that model on. That's not how our industry normally works. But believe me, when you are focused that that is what you have to do, it changes everything. It really does. But you need a contractor who are prepared to take on that challenge. Because we all know to take on, to take on board someone else's work and then progress it forward as your own, that's, that's, a, that's, a, real, that's a real big change. And that intellectual property changes with it. Now, when Bureau Happold created the design initially, and we passed it over to the contractor, obviously at that point it is still the model as was received. When I say model, I do mean multiple models. I don't necessarily mean a single. But the point is that 
yes, that model is going to change as your steelwork supplier comes on board, as your MEP contractor comes on board. They will develop the next, the next generation of those elements in the model, and they will subsequently be replaced. And over a period of time, yes, ultimately, that design model will, will be filtered and filtered and potentially may even well disappear. But that's not the point. The point is that you have to manage the model changing ownership and that prop intellectual property changing from the designer to the contractor. One of the big things that the client wanted to do is he wanted everything in a cloud platform that he could view at any time and he wanted all the design meetings, all the contractual meetings, everything to be driven from that software. Our solution that we used was BIM360 Glue. Three years ago when we adopted that product, we weren't particularly happy with it. But we're three years further down the road now, and it is absolutely critical and fundamental to everything that happens on site. One of the key things, again, in a change in the way that you have to, that you have to think about this is every week, all the contractors upload their latest work in progress models. Work in progress models. Not models that are, have been fine-tuned and finished and presented and then you see them. Work in progress models. So now you have to accept that it's work in progress. Obviously, not everything will be finalized. But this was a client requirement because they wanted that at any point when they went into this model to look at it, they wanted to see the latest thinking of the design. They didn't want to be out of date by a month or short of the official version that comes next week. Everything is work in progress, up to date, every single week. And that changes everything as well. I was really, really lucky with working with this client when we got to the stage to select the contractors. Because we actually went about that quite differently as well. So the first thing that we did was that we went out to the six contractors and got them to give us a BIM implementation up front. We got these six documents back and we realized, of course, right away, as you would expect, the six of them were completely different because every contractor had produced their own standard document. But we're a client who has to assess these companies against each other. What we did is we went back to the beginning and we created a standard template that we then re-gave to each of the contractors and asked them to submit their BIM documentation based on the template. When that came back, we had the easiest job in the world to compare those companies. The easiest job in the world. It changed absolutely everything. We had BIM interviews. We actually had the contractors come in with their BIM teams, including some of the people in this room, and, and literally had a BIM interview with the team of the people who were actually going to deliver the job. Great face-to-face, one-on-one interviews where we get a chance to give them some questions, they get a chance to ask us some questions. And then we talked about this open and honest handover, this change of ownership of models. And to begin with, there was a reluctance. To begin with, there was, you know, that's not the way we do things, I'm sorry. But again, the great thing was these are demands that the client put on the project from the very beginning. And that, I believe, is the importance of a knowledgeable client. By if they define what they want and they involve everyone in producing that, then I believe the outcome is much better. Now we're going to go into the contractor portion. Okay, thanks Craig. Now on to the easy bit. Um, just to give you a quick overview, I suppose, of our approach at the start and how we went about this, because obviously we had major logistical issues in a sense that we weren't physically present within Dubai. You know, we, we were 
we were a, a remote bidding team assisting our international division, but a large aspect of this, you know, it became very obvious just very quickly how serious the client was about BIM. So that was fantastic, number one. But the question is, if we're successful in the bid, how do we go about it? So you can see the number of people from our side specifically just working on the BIM delivery of this project. We have four individuals based in our head office in Kill, in Kildare. We have our startup BIM manager, Greg Byrne, who is now working, he's the BIM manager in the National Children's Hospital. So we're very fortunate to have Greg out there for a three month period lifting this project off the ground. And we, we owe a lot to himself for that because he did a fantastic job of getting it up and going. And now we have um, Derek Burke acting in the role of the BIM manager and Owen Ryan as a BIM coordinator out there. And these guys work daily, weekly with, with Craig and the team and the BAM team as well, moving the, the BIM delivery aspect of it forward. So, you know, it took that many people just to bring this one aspect of the scope to life. And for the most part, most of the people are still involved in some way, shape or form on a weekly basis in terms of keeping an eye on how this is working. When we drive it on further, you can see as we expand the team out, how it all then effectively works. So, you know, it's important to get the plan right from the start, understand the lines of communications, who talks to who, what the roles and responsibilities are. And I have to say, you know, the guys on the ground there, they've, they've really managed to carve it quite well themselves. They understand what they do. They are, they are self-starters as well. They're in a foreign country, you know, for, for, for our two guys who are based in Dubai, that's the first time there. But they've settled in quite well, thankfully, as well. And of course, that would be a concern when you send them over, is will they be homesick? Will they fit in? But, you know, things have gone well. So there's other considerations for us, apart from just, it's not like we're heading down to East Cork to start a project and someone can go home. Like they're, they're leaving their families behind as well. So, you know, a big ask. But they've been welcomed by the team there. They have other expatriates as well from, from over here in Ireland, and it's, it's like, like a big Irish job in some ways as well. So, you know, it's, um, and they're also bringing that cultural aspect of people socializing together and having a proper team kind of spirit as well. And it's something that, you know, we discussed that a couple of times over the last couple of days, is how positive the atmosphere is around the job. And there's a lot to be said for that. But it's rare you get a job where people get, get on so well. So it's nice to be involved in that and to have you know, such a good working relationship with the design team and the client as well. When we move on and we, we roll back around to the morass information requirements, so what was really interesting when we received this bid was the fact that we had to start pulling it apart into a language that we probably understood. So we were sitting there with a suite of documents in front of us, weren't entirely sure what was what. We assumed this was the employer's information requirement. You know, and you'll see other documents which kind of have similar, they have different names with similar approaches to other UK BIM Level 2 uh, standard templates. So it took a bit of time to consume it. We were pulling things apart, trying to figure out how we would respond, what was the best way to do it. And as Craig said, we, we ultimately made the decision that we would respond with a you know, standard PAS 1192 Part 2, an execution plan response, um, and which was rapidly given back to us and we were asked to go again with another template, and I wasn't at all happy about that. But um, Greg went out, we responded, and you can see life is nice and easy for Craig in the end, as he said, it was, it was a dream once he got his, his temporary response. <laughs> but it caused problems for us. But look, it was worth it in the end. So yeah, a really, really knowledgeable client. Um, really refreshing to see the kind of level of detail they had gone on to. They had really applied that smart approach, you know, um, they knew what they wanted, they were being quite prescriptive in an awful lot of ways where it mattered and they were being open but direct in other instances as well. We want this type of approach, it has to be cloud based, we want these standards to be applied, etc, etc. So it was nice not to be in a position where we felt like we were making up our own approach. They knew how they wanted this team to operate which is, which is great. The execution plan itself has been a genuine collaborative effort, probably the most collaborative execution plan we've ever been involved with. Again, really refreshing to have such an engaged um, client and, and design lead as well. I mean, a shout out, of course, to Anthony Lapierre. You know, he, he really assisted in sticking both parties together. And it was, it was great to see, you know, you, you had three people sitting down, really working through it. And if, they, if there was stuff there the guys didn't like, they were open and said, look, we don't like that approach. Can we look at this a different way? We could have a debate about it. Nobody was falling out. It was just a good old fashioned debate. And we got the right answer, I think, in the end. And of course, beyond you know, the, the project mobilization, it has continued to change as well. It's revisited at least once a month where we look at, are we actually doing what we're saying? If not, why not? Should we be doing it? Will we just change it in the text to match what we're currently doing on site? So this is very much a live document, moving and changing all the time. And you can see by the number of revisions alone, even on the first holding page, that it has literally been revisited the whole time. 
to be reflective of what's going on. Another good example, you can see on the right hand side, like the level of development, some good guidance, some really good guidance as to what was expected from us. Um, and that's not, there's not enough of that in the industry right now. You know, it can be a bit sketchy what somebody means when they say LOD4 or LOI this. You know, quite often they don't know themselves and they're not defining what the COBE output might be. So you're in a vacuum when you're bidding work. And at the end of the day, we've got to price and deliver. And it's, it's tough, you know, but this was one of those rare occasions where that wasn't the case. It was very clear what the client wanted. And I might add a really pragmatic approach as well. It wasn't we want the most detailed looking geometry. It was, we're interested in the information, the geometry has got to be fit for purpose to assist the project move on, but we're not going to come down too hard on you guys over that, we're going to be pragmatic about it, which is, which is great. So it you know, allowed us to get a strong sense of what, what had to be delivered, and critically, within our own internal management structure, we could go and say, look, you can see the amount of information that's required here, this is the type of prelims we need in here. It wasn't like there's a big gap, nobody knows what's needed, we put our guy on it, you know, it was like we definitely need at least two people on the project, so we could be clear ourselves from the start. On the left-hand side, then, you have the contractor's model development specification, kind of similar to a model production delivery table in some ways. So this will give you an idea of the type of stuff we were going through. A CMDS, that's a, an MPDT. I think there was like acronym wars going on in our office at one point as to what meant what. But, you know, all the fundamental aspects were there, which is really important. And there were no gaps in that tender documentation from our point of view. We couldn't find any fault with it. Um, so that was refreshing and gave us a good opportunity to get the price right. Beyond engagement, we obviously carry a kite mark with the, the BSI for UK BIM Level 2. And, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking with Craig and with Anthony and the team outside about how we were going to go about this and what BAM's approach would be. So, for the most part, most of these documents have been applied. You, you see Craig had an image of the BIM protocol up earlier on. So all of our subcontract supply chain are, are bought into that. They're all moving forward with it. But, you know, these documents and these guidance stand, you know, guidance documents are, are viable when it comes to how we go about our business now on the project. So the project has slightly evolved into to be a bit more BIM Level 2 centric than it would have been in the start, but like that, it's, it's kind of like a la carte. We're taking the best bits and the stuff that's not adding any value, we're just parking it because there's no point in just doing it for the sake of doing it. So, you know, I, I think that's, a, again, another pragmatic approach been taken by the teams. Um, you know, part four, which isn't up there obviously, but that's been used right now as we're going through the process of trying to understand how we define an asset and how we move that forward. As Craig mentioned, we don't have a, an operator in place just yet. So it's a bit of a guessing game as to how we best approach this, but we're going to go through a, a you know, process over about the next four or five months as to try and get the right answer um, for the client. The type of tech involved, um, again, no surprise, a lot of all less products. Tecla, Katia, like Geo Systems on the project as well. We have Salivri, Building Ops, um, we're, we're assuming it's probably going to be used in the end. We're using Synchro. So it's the who's who of the, the technology um, people are here. They're all adding value in their own way. Um, this is such a complex project. You know, open BIM based project or, you know, software tools have to be used. I mean, there is literally no straight piece of plasterboard in this building. This building is hyper complex. The facade, when you guys eventually see the facade that goes in, is a world class facade. You will never see anything like it. It is just incredible. And how it's been produced, I am actually astounded by it myself. It just looks amazing. But, you know, it's thanks to products like Katia and stuff like that, and like Geo Systems for helping us get it all set out in the right place as well, that these things are possible. But these are tools, that's what these are. You know, you still need fantastic designers like Craig and his team and, you know, competent contractors to go and actually deliver these buildings. But these are the tools we use to assist us in that process. And I personally don't think that this building would have been possible for, only for this technology. As Craig mentioned, the type of hyper-analysis and iterative design they've gone through has actually made the delivery of the project way more straightforward for BAM on site because this project has been very cleverly thought through by the design team. And I think there's a really key message in that. You know, this project works well because it's well designed. We're not making stuff up when we hit the site suddenly realizing we have to do something a slightly different way or we need to use a different type of facade or, or whatever the case might be. Our steel isn't gonna work. It works. It's very well rationalized. It's consistent. It's well sequenced. So for us, we are turning up and we are just building it. We're not having to do much, you know, design development on the fly. 
Um, this is the video that's going to play. Go. Or these are just some images actually from the, the Synchro model. You know, and again, logistics is a big thing for us on the site. It's a tight site. It's adjacent to the main public thoroughfare. You know, there's a, a main road right outside the door as well. And you can see some of the um, images from the tech of frame and how it's pulled together. So really, really nice to have that level of input from, the, um, from our specialists as well. And, you know, the virtual construction model, which again, as Craig said, we took the design model, we further developed it. And this is kind of, you know, the, the, the evolution of that as you see it before our eyes. But these are all coming from Blue. That's live, yeah, it's adding massive value in its defense, it's there, people can get into it, they can see what's currently going on, they understand what's IFC, you know, what's been issued for construction, what's currently work in progress and what's been shared. We're using the, we're applying the process of a, a common data environment to get it, against it and everything is well codified. So some very, like even the tunnel itself, traveling from one part of the building to the next is, is quite complex. It's not, it's not simple. It's a, it's a very, very complex structure. The concrete works again, not straightforward. Not many walls are vertical within this building, so an awful lot of complex concrete been poured there. And you can see the actual um, calligraphy within the facade as well. I mean, that in its own right. I mean, if I had to sit down and figure out how to get that model, I don't think I'd know where to start. It's it's really it's a it's an impressive piece of um, of model. And again, you bring it all together, you know. And this is live. The guys are working on it as we speak in Dubai. Again, what's really impressive. Um, the model is everywhere. It, it, it infiltrates every aspect of what the team on site do. And you guys might not appreciate it, but this next picture says it all to me. That individual sitting on the left hand side there is our project manager, Sean McGinley. And this is a serious project manager, right? Roll the clock back five or six years from now. I couldn't possibly have imagined him sitting there using a tool like this, but it's his go-to tool on site. And those in the room who know Sean know what I'm talking about. This is what he does now. He sits down, he looks at his model. It's adding value for him. So that cultural journey with people like this, it takes time, but he's on a project where he simply couldn't be without that model. And I know when he lands back on these shores, he'd be all about, he'd want a model. He'd find it difficult to be in a project without a model, you know? But again, that ease of access through a tool like Glue, it's really, really important, breaking down that barrier. Like Navis works would be your next step up, but you kind of have to be a bit more confident to use something like that. Whereas with Glue, you dial in, it's basic stuff you can navigate away. So, you know, it's great for us to see that it has been used day in, day out on the project. It's adding value. It's informing the design as we go. Um, and I'm just going to pass over to Simon now, who's going to talk about how we would actually bring some of this virtual modeling, you know, to life on the actual ground as well. So thanks. Hello. So this is the part that we don't normally see in VIM. This is something that we don't see very often. And this is something that in Ireland we see only at the highest level of FDI investment. So we only see this type of, this example here in the likes of the semiconductor and the pharma work. And this is where we have a subcontractor that's using the digital model, not only for their, their design purposes, but also to set out their information. And this was part of one of the two trips that I made, made over to Dubai. When I was over in Dubai, I went for two reasons. The first trip was over to help set up the digital site management system and to talk about the spatial requirements. And we went over and sat with the subcontractors and the trades, with the design team, with the BEP in front of us. And we decided on how we were going to quantify all our tolerances, all our setting out procedures, and everything we were going to do to ensure that this was going to work out properly. And this gave us massive insight in bringing the information back, the spatial information, back from the site, back into design, so people could understand that things were in the right place and that everything was going to work out. And one of the big things that we used to do this is because we have such a complex structure, because we have such a great curve on it, this building itself is 100, whoops, wrong slide, this building itself is 120 metres long, it's 80 metres high. There's a lot of, beside a very busy road, beside very heavy high buildings, beside an active tram line, it's almost impossible to get the survey control in place to justify that everything's the right place. So we use laser scanning technology, which we've used here before on multiple projects, to capture the information. And this information then went back in, and it allowed us to capture the progress of the construction as it went by. 
One of the things that we have and one of the conditions that we don't suffer from here in Ireland is temperature. In Dubai the temperature can swing by up to 50 degrees in 24 hours. And when you're building a large steel structure, the movement of that steel, I think it's is it a millimetre per two metres or something like that, is absolutely colossal. But by using laser scanning on a daily basis, we are able to capture the shapes and use that to show in the design meetings, in glue, with the design team, with the subcontractors, with the steel workers, everyone that was involved, how progress was going, where there were issues, where there had to be changes and so on. And it's very much a real-time process. So movement is very, very quick on this. We can see what's happening as it's happening, as they're doing it. And it allows for changes to be made. It allows to ensure that things are in tolerance. And it allows confidence in the design team that the design is progressing as it should be, or the construction is progressing as it should be. So it's a very, very iterative, very, very live process using the best technology and the local team to support everything that we can do on site. Here we have a picture of the laser scan and model combined. The upper one here, the large one, is the beam that was poured in one day, or two days, I think it was two days. It's uh, basically the same, same diameter as a container, so it's three by three meters, and it can consist the whole way around the building. The mesh, the steel mesh in that is so thick you cannot put your hand through it. There's so much steel in that. And that was poured in the space of maybe 24 hours. But all that was modelled up, laser scanned, and compared to the model. And you can see on the other side, the holding down bolts that were also laser scanned, there's a point cloud at the bottom and there's a point cloud model at the top. So for all the steel work that goes around that ring beam, all the holding bolt down bolts had to be correct. Because steel, unlike timber, doesn't bend and has to fit in to match perfectly. So everything was validated as it goes up. We're validating all the steel work, all the holding down bolts, everything for the facade, everything for the mechalek, everything is being validated to ensure that it all fits in the right place. And this is all being fed back into the BIM model. It was all defined in the BEP, which is very unusual, but it leads us to have a construction process that's more complete. We have complete ownership of the cycle, of the building. We understand more about what's happening and we can make changes if they're needed reflecting what's happening on site and not what we think is happening. So you can see here's another example of the next one, here's a very quick slide. It's more steel work and more guys out validating. And you can see just over here, just um, I can put the mouse over here, just this little steel here. That steel is modeled there, I don't have a picture of it, but that steel was modeled, was constructed incorrectly. So there's a slope on that steel that shouldn't be there. That should be much, much gentler pitch. And when you compare that to the model, you can see the rebar coming out through the top of the concrete. Now, it doesn't have any impact on the project because there's a cover on top of it. But it showed very quickly that there could be a disconnect when the site guys are going out to install rebar, to make the rebar, a small little miss looking at the wrong drawing or looking at the wrong information can have a large consequence on site that isn't picked up very often. But because we're able to see it, we know what the impact was, we're able to move on without worrying about it too much. The other reason that I was out on the site was it to implement the site management system for the collection of data, for the quality assurance, for safety on site, and also for the management of assets on site. So we're using BIM 360 Field out in that project uh, as a constru construction tool. It's being used to capture all the checklists, all the issues, everything that's being raised on site, and to feed all the information back into the glue model and to feed it in reports back to the construction of the design teams. It's also going to be used as part of the asset collection tool for FM at the end. While we don't know who the final FM operator may be, by using the likes of the BIM360 application, we're able to capture all the asset information now. So as we build the building, as we install the steel, each piece of steel is an element. It has all the checklists attached to it, it has all the issues raised, it has all the construction photos attached to it. So at any time, the FM owner will be able to look back at the life cycle of that piece of steel or the panel, or the MEP, or anything that may be there. So it's a complete cycle, it goes the whole way around. So it goes from design, into glue, into field, site data is captured, it's fed back into glue, and back into the model where required, so we can use filters to show progress that's being made. Click. Same slide. Same slide. So what we're doing is we're identifying the assets early on. This happened at the very start of the project. They knew what they wanted to have. They knew where the air conditioning units were going to be, where the power was going to be, where the lighting was going to be. Design was very complete. So by, in a, by, by able to identify the assets and create our asset model, 
we're able to create the equipment sets so that when we go out in the field we can capture the relevant information. So when we go out and we look at a boiler or we look at a pump or we look at a light switch or an air handling unit or whatever it may be, we can track the status of that object. We can track and say this object has been delivered to the site, it's been put in its right location, it's been installed, it's been commissioned, we can take capture photographs of it to show where it is and how it's working and we can show all the information that's relevant to the facility management operations. And we're also doing that for the likes of the panels, so we're tracking the life cycle of the panels. So as the panels are being structured or manufactured, we put a barcode on it, it gets shipped to the site, we scan the barcode, we know it's on site, we check the condition, we take a progress, an image of that to make sure it hasn't been damaged, we move it to the right location, we install it, we complete the checklist to say it's been installed, we take pictures to show it's been installed correctly, we note there's no damage to it or if there is any marks with how it's, what's happened to it. And all the time we do this, a dashboard is appearing for the project manager and for the client showing the progress of those panels, showing the progress of the frame, showing the progress of whatever it may be, and that allows them to see how the build is progressing at any given time. But because we're doing it at the very start and throughout the progress of the life cycle of the project, we're also able to capture all the relevant information. So these are some slides um, from some of the schools we completed because they're not in the, in the, in the museum yet. But we capture all the information, scan information, uh, red line information, photographs, all the information is there to be captured to allow us to show what's happening at what stage of that element. And that's all come through from the model, it's gone through the whole design process, and now it can go back into that process. So we, when we assess, the, we assess that an object is at a particular stage, be it installed, commissioned, ready for use, whatever it may be, that information can be fed back through Glue, back into the Revit model, and a filter can then change the status. So when you look at the model as a designer, you can see the status of an element, whether it's been installed, delivered, commissioned, whatever it may be. Okay? And that's about it. Craig has one last slide, which is all about the most important thing. Okay? This is the one thing that has, I would say, undoubtedly created this project more than anything else, which is communication. And Greg and Paul and Craig and Michael and myself, this is the one thing that this project did extremely well. It may have been fraught at times, but it was always open and it was always ongoing and it was always there. And it was a very, very um, pleasant place to work, despite the temperature. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, guys, we're running a little behind time, but we've still got five minutes left for questions. Um, I have one or two that I had written down that would be interested just... Craig, maybe from your perspective, um, what was really interesting was obviously you had a very, very informed client. So the EIR was probably very advanced before they went anywhere near the market. Um, but perhaps there was a lot of extensive development of the BEP between yourselves and the contractors. What sort of time was involved there? Um, and, and how do you tie that in perhaps to maybe a more traditional style contract? <coughs> Yeah, as I, as I said, obviously we're, we're, we're really lucky in this case. I mean, the, the development of these documents happened as we went along, really. You know, we, 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 we developed these as we went, or, or the document existed at the beginning, and then we, you know, as, as things did, we, we changed it, we adapted it. There was a comment made that if we discovered that something that was written in the document was actually being done differently on site, then we changed the document. It, it, the document had to reflect what worked on a day-to-day -day basis. So, that, so it wasn't that there was a big delay really in the, in the development of these documents. They were, all, they were all done at the same time. But this idea of communication, you know, week, literally weekly meetings. And in fact, when, when um, uh, BAM came out to, to Dubai initially, I think we had a week. I think we had a week where we did nothing but sit in a room and talk through the through these documents. And but the great thing was that we had everybody in that room. We had the client, we had the you know, the architect, we had ourselves, we had the contractor. And and it was about producing something collaboratively that everybody was happy with. That's not that's not an easy thing to do. But what you get if you do that is everybody's actually happy with the documentation. You get to the end and and, and what you're doing is practical and it works and, and we're actually doing it for real life on the project. So, you know, it's just another basic question. I, I'm not sure if it was 
actually the original intent and this is what the guys would have priced but the innovation of design so that's something that had gone out to the market the market had all been asked to take account of it yeah that, that's, that's a that's a really that's a really good one because um uh, I, th I thought the client did it particularly well. In fact, we were just talking about this yesterday. So what the way that it worked was that um, the design, let's, let's say that the design wasn't quite complete, if you like. You know, there were still outstanding issues. There were still outstanding coordination that needed to be done. That hadn't all been finished at the handover stage. But part of the reason of having this collaborative approach and, and having the contractor on board to discuss this was we actually had discussions about all these issues that were outstanding. And the comment or the, 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 the clause that the client made was that in the bid, in the price that they bid, they had to allow for all the known issues at the handover. And the reason for that is because the client didn't want the contract to come in back after the event looking for variations for things that they already knew were stuff that needed to be resolved. It's a schedule of no numbers. But it's, it's, it was being really honest. It was actually people being really honest. It was people stand, prepared to stand up and say, this issue still exists and needs to be resolved. Take account of it in your price by all means. But don't come back later and ask for a variation if it's already something that you know is an issue. Which, and that's quite, I mean, that, again, I thought that was a very different approach. Yeah, it's very open book. Very open book, very honest, yeah, absolutely. Sean, can I, can I just say, I think a couple of lessons could be learned from that approach as well. Again, it was quite pragmatic from the client, but the, the rules of engagement were clear from the start that we had to price for that. And, you know, for us, coming from the industry we in, it was a bit alien. It was like, how do we price for that? But we did. And you know it wasn't scoffed that way either, either. and it, it, it said it out clear from the start. But you have knock-ons from that as well. RFIs are, are kept to a minimum. Yeah. yeah. And when RFIs, we're not saying there's not changes because there is changes. You know, there's maybe things don't work, and they, these are legitimate RFIs, legitimate claims, legitimate variations. The client maybe asks for something to change. So it's not that there's not change and there's not variations. There is. Um, but, the, but it does keep the RFIs to a minimum on the site as well, because the contractor is basically resolving issues that existed as, as part of the process of developing the final solution. Yeah. I would say, undoubtedly, when you look at your program, you've been hugely helped by the client. Yes. The, the fact that the client was so informed and set such a prescriptive yeah. um, wish list out, I mean, in the AR, obviously, I mean, you, you could add probably 12 to 18 months. That had you not been, and all the anxiety. And, and, and the thing is, too, I mean, I'm saying this is a, a real success story. I mean, equally, I've been running projects at the same time that don't have that same collaborative environment, don't have that same relationship between the parties, and the, and the difference is incredible. So it's, it's quite annoying, actually, when you know what works, and yet we're still running projects in some cases in an environment that we know doesn't work. But I, I, I can only hope that we'll, you know, the industry will get better at that. But the good thing is we know what does work, and hopefully we can work towards making sure that all the projects are done on it. Very good. Guys, any more questions? Yeah, well, I have a quick one here. I suppose when we look back to the heady days of Latham and Egan and we look at collaborative approach and the industry's perspective of that um, back in the day, we, we didn't really believe that we could get to potentially the place that you're talking about. And I suppose... Just looking at that collaborative approach, you know, having your list of known unknowns and, and potentially, you know, the cost associated with that. Um, and then we look at your Gina's uh, insights into potential, you know, implementation of BIM through the process and uh, the collaboration involved there and the associated costs. I mean, Georgina had, had indicated, you know, 30% savings uh, of course board uh, in implementation of BIM um, as a course manager, project manager, you know, is this the sort of thing that you've seen on this project, working with BAM, that the collaboration has led to those kind of savings, um, and were they specifically pertained to your <coughs> known unknowns? I know that's a big question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose there's, there's maybe even an easy answer. The project's on budget and on time. I don't know that I've been able to say that too many times, to be honest. 
but, it, but that's, that's the position that we're in. Now, whether that's a reflection of, of this process that we'll, we'll put in place, I, I believe it is. I believe it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not that there aren't problems. Um, I think there was another approach that, that worked well. I mean, we all, we all still have contracts and, you know, everyone is still working within a very contractual frame and we have our known deliverables and everything else. But I think what, what happened here was that the BIM team specifically um, almost sort of set themselves aside from that. Yes, the contracts are all in place, but we are more interested in having a successful project. And we were we were collaborating maybe in a way that was out even maybe outside of what our formal contracts were telling us, but we knew it was right in in the sense of coming together to do it in, in a better way. But I think the problem that sometimes is this this contractual relationship that we have gets in the way. And I think when people allow that to happen, the BIM part of the project suffers because you don't you know, it gets in the way of this very collaborative approach. Okay, well, I just add to that as well. I mean, the, the cost saving of this project, it, it was competitively bid. So from our point of view, when we read the documentation and we assess the risk and we go through a stage gate with our group company in the Netherlands, you know, the risk on this project was actually far less than you'd realize because of the amount of effort in the development, the design, and the honesty in the way it was approached actually from the client's perspective. They weren't expecting us to carry Buckets of risk, and they weren't, you know, it wasn't a situation where they were not allowing us to price risk. It was quite fair and equitable. So, you know, that project is on time, it's on budget, but it was a competitively bid budget. It was significantly cheaper than our next competitor. As well. And one other comment, and we talked about it earlier, is quantities, taking quantities from the models. It was written into our BIM execution plans that the cost consultant ACOM would take their quantities from the model. But we actually had to sit with the cost consultant and understand exactly how they did that so that they were getting the right quantities from the model that they needed. But what that meant was that the price that was being um, estimated at the design stage was actually really pretty accurate because that information was coming from the model wasn't being manually lifted from drawings. In the majority of the cases, it was actually directly coming from the model. Hi. Great presentation. I just, there were a couple of comments um, during the presentation about picking and choosing stuff from the BIM level two, PAS 1192, uh, and taking out the stuff that didn't have value. Can you give some examples of things you feel uh, don't add, it, that's currently in the PAS 1192, that doesn't add value. Yeah, like security requirements, for example, on the project. Like when you look at the requirements in level two BIM around security requirements, it's actually quite onerous. But again, we were like, we're not too concerned about that. We have a practical approach to that. So we would park that extremely onerous exercise. Um, and again, from a, another one, for example, would be the uh, development of an asset. So we have a very, pragmatic approach to how we develop assets. I mean, BAM ourselves, through our PVP projects, have a very simple formula as to how we define an asset. And that's something we're feeding through right now. So we don't need to go through that lengthy process of beating it down this way. So we were trying to be clever where we could be clever. Um, and I'm not saying at all this was the right thing to do. You know, maybe time will tell. But we're trying to bring that experience. It's a bit like last planning. You're trying to bring as much experience to bear on the process you're going through. And it works for us in our operations with our FM company, and I've no doubt it would work for you know, any other FM provider, be it a museum or, or a school or a court, whatever the case might be. Inter be Interestingly, the client had a huge list of specifications that they wanted used on the project, PAS alumni to being one of them. But the reality was they were, ju they were just this list that someone had created yeah. with no understanding of what any of this meant. And actually, I believe it was, it was Greg who's at the back of the room. We, we sat in that, in that weekly meeting that they beat the, in the last of the week. And we went through those specifications point by point. And do you know, actually, when I read half of them, I didn't even know what they meant. You know, the, the language and the, the, the way that they're written, you know, they're, they're so hard to understand. And that's what, you know, I meant about this sort of common sense approach. 
If there's something in there and you don't even understand what it means, you know, what use is that? What use is that to you? you know, so very much it was a case of, um, and, and, and certainly in the case of BAM, they brought a lot to the table from their experience of projects that they've already done, especially in that asset management site, um, which we just adopted. Brilliant, absolutely. You, you know, it's existing experience, you know works. You don't reinvent it again. You, just use it. Maybe time for one last question. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, everybody. Uh, and thank you for sharing such a lovely project. Uh, I'm Emma Hayes from Digital Build Consultants. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one of the points that you made, Craig, in your element of the presentation. You spoke about model ownership and how for this um, to be truly successful, the project, the model needs to be handed over to the contractor for the construction stage. And I 100% agree with that. But in terms of the practicality on this project, how did you deal with RFIs and technical queries, queries post-contract award? Well, the, the, design, the design responsibility still lies with the, you know, with the consultant. You know, we, we still retain the design responsibility. So questions or RFIs or whatever that come up in relation to the basic design you know, still, still went back to Bureau Happel to be answered. You know, it wasn't that, that necessarily BAM took that over. But certainly from the, the model handover point of view, the physical sort of ownership of things, you know, that was, that was what shifted. Um, the, but the, the design responsibility still, still lay with, with Bureau Happel. Um, just to clarify, did you continue with a design model then as BAM developed the, the construction model? No, that was so the line in the sand. Absolutely what the client did not want yeah. to happen. Yeah. So how did you respond to RFIs and technical queries if you didn't have a source of the information yourselves? Because the thing is, we, we, are, we are embedded with these guys. You know, yeah. we're, we're working with the site team all the time. It, it's almost like it's not their model, it's everybody's model. Yeah, you okay. Know, that's, that's the way to think about it. You yeah. know, maybe, maybe rather than them and us, it's ours. You know, maybe that's more the approach. Yeah. And that was, that was the comment that was being made about, you saw the site foreman, then you saw the project manager, then you saw the design team. Doesn't matter who you are or what company you're in, we're all using one model to resolve the issues. We, we actually have a we actually have an interesting initiative uh, at the moment. We're looking to again this challenge on museum of the future. We're looking to use more VR. VR is the big sort of you know uh, the, the the real gimmick at the moment. What what can you? So we've actually challenged ourselves to to adopt VR more on site. And our challenge is that it's not to be adopted as a gimmick. It's to be adopted for a practical reason, and we hope that that practical reason is to reduce the time it takes to resolve RFIs. If the use of VR can let people understand the problem quicker, discuss what that solution has to be, and then solve it, then for us, that's a practical reason to adopt VR, not just, you know, oh, it looks great with the headset on, you know. So that's the kind of challenges that we're, we're putting to ourselves, actually. I mean, it's not that you know, that's even in the BEP. We're, we're actually now challenging ourselves to do things differently. OK, guys, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to wrap up just by um, thanking all our speakers this morning, from Sarah, having traveled all the way from Germany, to give us what was a great insight into the, the work of uh, the Built and Smart um, and Doibem. Um, thanks to Dominic for taking the time to give us an overview in terms of where the industry is going and how construction companies themselves need to be prepared for where the digital transition is going to be in a couple of years' time and how, what our expectations are in terms of other stakeholders at government level. Um, to the two contractors in BAM and both ACB for sharing their own experience, where they are, how, they've, how far they've come. It's incredible, really. You look at, you've got a small enough team, relatively speaking, when you consider the responsibility and the roles that you've undertaken. So it's a, it's a great credit to your company, um, how far you've come so far in that journey.